Well, I invite you on this Lord's Day to come with me into a little parable. A little parable that came alive for me while living and serving in the Philippines. From 1985 to 1989, I served as a senior pastor of Union Church of Manila, an international congregation in the midst of the heart of that massive city. When I became the pastor, the church was made up of people from 35 different countries of the world and from 30 or so different Christian traditions, which meant I was regularly in trouble with someone (laughs) for not doing it right. During those years in the Philippines, the Lord gave me the opportunity to travel throughout Asia. I spoke for a pastor's conference in Bangkok, Thailand. I taught on worship and preaching for a seminary in Tainan, Taiwan. I spent two weeks in Beijing speaking for an international congregation meeting at the Austrian embassy. And during that time, Sharon and I witnessed the so-called people power revolution through which I learned more of how the kingdom of God comes and does not come into the world. I've been back to Manila many times, and I've had the opportunity to teach in Hong Kong. A couple of years ago, I spoke for two weeks for the Hong Kong Bible Conference, and Jeremy came with me and uh, took care of me during that time. He made sure I had the light. (laughs) Now, the parable into which I am inviting you this morning came alive for me because... We were living in Manila, in Asia. Let me say that again. The little parable came alive to me because we were living in Asia. I do not know if it would have come alive the way it has for me had the Lord not called us to live in Asia. It is a parable recorded by Luke the physician in the 11th chapter of his gospel, verses 5 through 8. It's a parable about a man receiving a midnight midnight guest, needing to put some food before him, going to his friend, asking his friend to help him, and being told to go away. It is usually called the friend at midnight. But because of what I learned, because I was living in Manila, the parable should be called... Well, you'll see. Now, as is the case when studying any of Jesus' parables, we need to hear and see the parable in its original context, in the original cultural context, and in the original literary context. So, we're going to read the verses before the parable and after the parable. We're going to read Luke 11, verses 1 through 13. Hear the word of God. It should be coming up for you. It came about that while he, Jesus, was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John the Baptist also taught his disciples. And Jesus said to them, When you pray, say, Father, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, and now here's the little parable. Suppose one of you shall have a friend and shall go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me from a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside he shall answer and say, Do not bother me. The door has already been shut. My children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence or shamelessness, He will get up and give him as much as he needs. 
And I say to you, ask, it shall be given to you. Seek, you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it shall be opened. Now, suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he is asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you are teaching us something about your Father in this text that we would have never deduced on our own. And so I pray that you would, by the power of your Spirit, open up what you have revealed in a fresh and powerful way for us. For we ask this in your name. Amen. Okay. The original context in which Jesus taught this parable involves him being asked to teach his disciples to pray. After spending time alone, the first group of disciples say to Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray just as John the Baptist taught his disciples to pray. Now, you might know that this is the only thing any of Jesus' disciples are recorded to have asked Jesus to teach them. There's no record of, Lord, teach us to heal. There's no record of, Lord, teach us to lead or teach us to counsel, or teach us to cast out demons, or teach us to do justice, or teach us how to change culture, or teach us how to evangelize, not even, Lord, teach us how to preach. Just, Lord, teach us how to pray. Why? Because I think the first disciples could see that Jesus leading teaching, healing, counseling, liberating, justice advocating, culture changing, evangelizing, preaching ministry, emerges from his relationship with the one he calls Father. And they could see that the key to that relationship is prayer. Jesus is regularly slipping away from the crowds to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. I take the request to mean more than, Lord, teach us some new prayer techniques. I take the request to mean, teach us what you know about your Father that makes you want to pray. So Jesus teaches them a short form of the Lord's Prayer and then teaches them the little parable, again, usually called the friend at midnight. Now, clearly, in the original context, Lord, teach us to pray, the parable is intended to make his first disciples and us want to pray. Does it? Does it make you want to pray? Luke 11, verse 8, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you anything because of his friend, yet because of his persistence or shamelessness, he will get up. Does that make you want to pray? Traditional Western interpretation of the parable, and by Western I'm meaning European, North American, Australian, traditional Western Christianity has done two things with this parable. Number one, it has said that the parable is about the one who is asking for bread. That is, the parable is about us who pray. And number two, it says... It is said that the parable calls us to persistence in prayer. Verse 8 again, as it has been translated for centuries, because of his persistence, or now newer versions will have, boldness, audacity, even shameless audacity. Now, it was because of what I learned, because I was living in Asia, that I came to see that the traditional Western interpretation of this parable is off the mark. It does not get the wonderful thing that Jesus is revealing in this parable. 
As I learned to look out at life through a Filipino worldview, which I was discovering is very similar to the Middle Eastern worldview in which Jesus spoke and taught, and as I, in that Asian context, learned more about the Middle Eastern worldview through the work of missionary theologian Kenneth Bailey, who spent 35 years studying and teaching in Lebanon, Syria, uh, Jordan, and Israel, I came to see that, number one, the parable is not about the one asking for bread, and number two, the parable does not call us to persistence. Let me say that again. The parable is not about the one who's asking for bread, And number two, the parable is not about persistence in prayer. There's a parable in Luke 18, the widow and the unjust judge. That is about persistence, but not this parable in Luke 11. Verse 8, because of his persistence or boldness, we now know that is not the right way to render the word that Jesus uses. Well then, what is the parable about? In order to see and hear what Jesus is revealing, we need to make five observations. Observation one, the parable begins with a question. Verses five through seven are a question. And the only English version I know that gets this is the ESV, which was published in 2001. Most versions begin with the one we used this morning, suppose. Suppose one of you shall have a friend. Now, if you have a study Bible, you will notice there's a little notation, a little number above the word suppose. And that little notation is to guide you to what are called the marginal readings in the middle of the pages. And when you look at the marginal reading, you will see the words lit, which one of you? Lit means literally, literally, which one of you? Verses 5 through 7 are a question. Which one of you? It's, it's one long sentence. Let's see if I can do it in one breath. Which one of you has a friend shall go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread for a friend of mine has come on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And the one inside the house answers, do not bother me. The door is already shut. My children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. It's one long question. Which one of you? with the nuance of, can you imagine? Which one of you can imagine? I'm going to give the two men in the parable names, very creative names, Mr. Outside and Mr. Inside. (laughs) Which one of you can imagine Mr. Outside receiving a guest at midnight and needing to put food in front of him? Which one of you can imagine then going to Mr. Inside and asking for help in order to feed his friend? And which one of you can imagine Mr. Inside saying, my children and I are bed, the door is shut, go away. Which one of you can imagine that scenario? Which one of you can imagine it? So observation one, the parable begins with a question. Am I clear? Observation two, the culturally expected answer. Which one of you? And the culturally expected answer is none of us. In the Middle East, you will never, ever hear, go away, I cannot get up and give you anything. In the West, you can imagine that. In the West, Mr. Inside may even call the police. (laughs) Or at least he's going to call the building supervisor. But not in the Middle East. It's simply impossible. I've tested this all over the Middle East. 
I've asked people in Lebanon and Jordan and Armenia and Nazareth, can you imagine this scenario? And the uniform answer is no, it is impossible. I tested this all over the Philippines. The universal answer, no. I tested this in Beijing, no. I've asked people in Vancouver who are from Hong Kong, Thailand, Vietnam, India, Ethiopia, Iran, and the uniform answer is no. The scenario is culturally impossible. Why? Why is it impossible? Observation three. Because of the essential cultural values at work in the parable. Two essential cultural values in the Middle East and in Asia. They are, and those of you from those parts of the world can tell us what they are, hospitality and the avoidance of shame. They're the two deepest working cultural values. Hospitality and the avoidance of shame. Now, these values are at work in the parable in a number of ways. The host, Mr. Outside, must place before his midnight guest more food than he can eat. I was taken by this the first time that Sharon and I were invited to a Filipino home. We arrived with our two children. We only had two at that time. And there was so much food on the table. I asked, who else is coming to dinner? No one else. Just I and my family. And there was no way we could eat all the food that was set before us. And so, on the most recent trip to Hong Kong that Jeremy came with, every time we were fed, there's more food on the table than we can eat. You must put more food on the table than you can eat. Am I right, some of you? Right, they're shaking their heads. Mr. Outside is asking for three loaves of bread. Now, in that day, those are the utensils with which to eat the meal. The meal consisted of a kind of stew in a big bowl. Folks would break off a piece of bread, dip it in the bowl, and then bring the bread with the stew into their mouth, then break off another piece of bread, dip it in the bowl, and do the same thing. Jesus says he, Mr. Inside, will get up and give him as much as he needs because Mr. Outside needs more than the bread. He needs a whole lot more. Meaning, he's going to have to go to other neighbors to get onions and carrots and mushrooms and beans. He has a whole lot more work to do that night. One more thing about the cultural dynamics at work. The guest of Mr. Outside is the guest of the whole village, not just the Mr. Outside. And Mr. Inside is aware of this. Mr. Outside is extending hospitality on behalf of the whole village, and Mr. Inside knows he must play a part in doing this. Okay, follow me all right so far? Now, observation four. The actual word that Jesus uses in the parable. Verse eight, because his, of his anidion. A-N-A-I-D-I-A-N, anidion. I was teaching this at a family camp one time and a little girl turned to her mother afterwards and said, why did the speaker keep talking about the man having a nightie on? (laughs) Now you won't forget the word. That is the Greek word that is variously translated as persistence, boldness, or audacity. Now get this, get this. In the first century, the word did not mean persistence. It did not develop that meaning until the 3rd century A.D. If you had a 1st century dictionary, there were none, but if you had one and you looked up the word anidion, it would not say means persistence. It would say means shamelessness. So in many study Bibles, you'll find a little notation on top of the word persistence. This little notation will take you to the marginal reading. And the marginal reading says, lit shamelessness, or lit avoidance of shame. By the way, having lived in Asia, I discover every time you have this marginal reading, it should have been the reading. The newest Greek dictionary scholars have composed lists shamelessness as the number one meaning of anidion. Now, shame is a negative quality. Shamelessness is a positive quality. Middle Eastern cultures are shame-based cultures. 
So are most Asian, some Hispanic, African. Roman and Greek, British and German, Caucasian, Canadian, and American cultures are guilt-based cultures. Yes, in the Middle East there are rules, but daily life is practically governed by shame. Now, not shame in the way we use it in the West, as in, oh, I feel terrible about myself, but shame as in losing face, shame as in damaging my reputation. In the West, uh, parents discipline their children by saying, that is wrong. But in the Middle East and Asia, parents discipline their children by saying, that is shameful. A fundamental cultural value. I will do anything and everything to avoid bringing shame on myself, on my name, on my family, on my city. Now, I learned this in Manila in a number of ways. One is this. You never open a birthday gift at the birthday party, right? Why? Because if you give me a gift that I don't like, my displeasure will be reflected on my face and bring shame on your face. So I wait until I get home to open the present. And that way, if I don't like it, no one else needs to know. And it gives me time to process my disappointment so that when I see you the next time, I can genuinely thank you. This came in handy uh, when we were living in Glendale, California. <clears throat> Glendale, California is the largest Armenian city outside of Armenia. And uh, we had lovely neighbors, oh, very lovely neighbor, Armenian neighbors, and she knew it was my birthday. So she got me this gift. I was out working in the yard, and she brought me this gift nicely uh, wrapped, and I knew not to open it. Oh, was I glad I didn't open it. <laughs> so I took it home, and I unwrapped it, and it was this <sighs> ugly purple sweater. I mean, it was expensive, but it was purple. I'm not going to wear purple. So it gave me time at home. Sharon was there, and I could process this. What am I going to do with this gift? It gave me time to process it, then put the purple sweater on and go to my neighbor and thank her. Another way I learned about this avoidance of shame was through the so-called third-party reconciliation process. If I have an issue with you, I do not go to you directly. At least not, not at first. I go to another friend with whom I can express myself freely. I get out my disgust or my suspicion or my anger. Then my friend goes to you. And, and then you, my friend goes to you, he expresses my concerns, and then you have the freedom to express your concern about my concern, your disgust about my disgust. And do that so that when we finally do meet, we can treat each other without either of us losing face. Would that Western political leaders understood this about the rest of the world? You do not shame a leader of the world in Asia or the Middle East in public. It will backfire. A nideon. Avoidance of shame at all costs. Now, if a nideon means avoidance of shame, then why have Western Bibles for so long translated it as persistence? Or boldness or audacity? Well, partly because Westerners can't understand this idea of shame. It's hard to get our minds around. But mostly because Westerners could not understand how this quality applies to the man who's asking for bread. I mean, what, why does... Asking for bread involves shame. Why does one lose face in asking for help to extend hospitality to a visitor? Well, well, well. The question leads to the fifth observation. Observation five. Ready? Are you with me? Observation five. Ready? I'm looking. You're, you're ready. Okay. This is the key part of the whole sermon. A nideon does not refer to the one who is asking for bread. It does not apply for Mr. Outside. It refers to the one who's B 
being asked for bread. It applies to Mr. Inside. And it was Kenneth Bailey who helped me see this. He says we need to look carefully at verse 8. And in verse 8, there are six clauses. I think we'll have these up here. Do we have these up there on, on the screen? Okay. The six clauses are, even though he will not get up and he give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his anity on, he will get up and he will give him everything he needs. Clause one, even though he will not get up, who's the he? Guy inside. And he give him anything, who's the he? Guy inside. Because he is his friend, guy inside. Yet because of his anidion, come back to that in a moment, who's that he? Clause five, he will get up, who's that he? The guy inside. And he will give him as much as he needs. Who's the he? The guy inside. Now, if Mr. Inside is the subject of five of the six clauses, is it not reasonable to assume that he's the subject of all six clauses? The quality of an ideon refers to the guy being asked. It applies to Mr. Inside. Because of Mr. Inside's shamelessness, Mr. Inside will get up and he will give Mr. Outside as much as he needs. Are you hearing Jesus? Do you see what he is wanting us to see through this parable? Even if Mr. Inside hates Mr. Outside, Mr. Inside is going to get up and give Mr. Outside as much as he needs because he does not want the story going around the village the next morning that he did not help this man extend hospitality to a visitor. The point is, there's something beyond friendship. And it is the avoidance of shame. I'm not going to damage my reputation. I'm not going to lose face. I do not want the rumor to go around Vancouver tomorrow morning that I did not help Vancouver extend hospitality to a late night visitor. I do not want anyone to say to me in the morning, why did you fail to help us? I don't want to hear anyone say to me, shame on you. You shamed us by not helping. Okay, now we're ready to hear and see what Jesus is revealing in the parable. And it's stunning. Lord, teach us to pray. So Jesus teaches a short form of the Lord's Prayer, and then he teaches us the parable. And the parable is not about the one asking. It's about the one being asked. That is, the parable is not about we who pray. It's about the Father to whom we pray. When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Father, honor your name. And he does. He always does. In his parable, Jesus is saying, the Father has an ideon. The Father has shamelessness. The Father has avoidance of shame. Or to put it in a more uh, biblical ter familiar biblical terms, the Father will always act in a way that honors his name. The Father will never shame his name. Wow. And what is the Father's name? Well, he has many names. El Shaddai, El Rophe, Jehovah Jireh, on it goes. But the name above every name is the name Yahweh. The name above every name is I am who I am. The living God meets Moses out in the desert. And God says, I have seen my people's affliction. I have heard their cry. I feel their suffering. So I'm coming down to deliver. Moses says, wow, I've never heard of a God like this. What is your name? And God says, my name is I am who I am, Yahweh. My name is Yahweh, I am. Not I am in the philosophical sense as though God is contemplating himself, go away. But I am I, who I am in a relational sense. I am who I am with you and for you. 
Yahweh, the sacred name. I am who I am with you and for you. This is God's covenant name. In every covenant God ever made with humanity, we find the phrase, I will be your God and you will be my people. It's God's way of saying, all that I am, I place at your disposal. All that makes me be God, I place at your disposal. All my power, all my mercy, all my wisdom, all my creativity, it is all at your disposal. At your disposal. And the wonder of all of that is packed into the name Yahweh. And Jesus is telling us in his little parable that the Father will always honor that name. The Father will never shame the name, I am with you and for you. God has gone public with this name. This is who I am. And God has placed his name on his people. These are Yahweh's people. God said, I am with you and for you. And he does not want to hear neighbors say that someone went to him asking for help and was turned to go, told to go away. Now, if you've read the Bible, you realize that this is how the people of the Old Testament prayed. They implicitly understood all this. For your name's sake, they would pray. So, for example, Moses again. He's out in the desert after the great exodus from Egypt. God's people have been disobedient. They grumble and they complain. And God says, I've had it with them. And he says to Moses that he's thinking about destroying them. And, and how does Moses pray? How does Moses pray to God in that moment? What are the Egyptians going to think? You're going to bring shame on your name. You said the Israelites are your people, that you are with them and for them, and if you destroy them, you're going to shame your name. And what does the Exodus text tell us? God changed his mind, and he persevered with the very people who wouldn't trust him. David, the psalmist, gets this. Psalm 25, verse 11, one of my favorite verses. For your name's sake, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. You said that if I came to you and confessed my sin, you would forgive me. It's at the heart of the new covenant. I will forgive your transgressions, and I will not remember your sin anymore. For your name's sake, pardon me. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us our sins. Faithful to what? To his name. I'm banking on your name. You said you'd pardon me if I came. Psalm 23. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside waters of rest. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. Why? Why? For his name's sake. The prophet Ezekiel got this big time. Ezekiel 37, verse 30, 22 and following. It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for my holy name, which you shamed among the nations where I sent you. I will prove my name holy. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues. I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will cleanse you. Why? For my name's sake. Are you following me? And do you see now how Jesus' parable answers the disciples' question, Lord, teach us to pray? He's giving them and us wonderful assurance in prayer. Yes, the Father loves us. Oh, how the Father loves us. Read Luke 15, the parable of the prodigal father sometime. Oh, how he loves us. But even if the Father does not love us, he loves us. He, he loves us, right? Witness. He loves us, but even if the Father does not love us, something else is going on. He loves his name. He has avoidance of shame. And he, Jesus is telling us we can count on this. The Father will always honor his name. It turns out that God's commitment to his name translated into his commitment to his people. For the sake of his great name, Yahweh will not reject you. It's the great assurance that Samuel speaks to Israel after Israel wants a king like other nations, a human king. That is, after Israel implicitly says they want a different king than Yahweh. How shameful that was. Yet, 1 Samuel 12, 22, for the sake of his great name, Yahweh will not reject you. I said, you are my people, I said, I am with you and for you, 
and I will not shame my name. So theologian John Piper can write, it was God's pleasure to join you to himself in such a way that his name is at stake in your destiny. Is that on the screen? Yeah. I'm going to say it again, though. It was God's pleasure to join you to himself in such a way that his name is at stake in your destiny. Or another way of putting it, it was God's good pleasure to possess you in such a way that what happens to you affects his name. Jeez. The Father's name is I am there with you and for you. I give you myself. Now, we're getting towards the end. What helps us understand, this helps us understand what Jesus says right after the parable. Luke 11, verses 9 to 10. Ask, seek, knock. It is not a call to persistence as though we have to wear God down. Rather, it's a great assurance. Assurance? Yes, why? Ask, seek, knock because something always happens when you ask, seek, and knock. Jesus is saying, something always happens when you pray. Ask, seek, and knock are in the present tense. The present tense in the the Greek language emphasizes continual action. So literally, Jesus is saying, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Why? Well, verse 10, receive, find, open. Receive and find are also in the present tense. Is receiving, is finding. So Jesus is saying, the one who keeps on asking is receiving. The one who keeps on seeking is finding. He is saying that as we keep praying, as we keep praying, something is happening. Something always happens when we pray. What is happening? Mother Teresa of India answered best. She says that as we keep praying, we are expanding our capacity to receive. As we keep asking and seeking, we are expanding our capacity to receive. To receive what? God. We are expanding our capacity to receive God. Thus, Luke 11, verse 13, the last line of the text. Will not the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who are asking him? African theologian St. Augustus of the third century said that the Holy Spirit is the embodiment of the love relationship between the Father and the Son. The Father loves the Son, and the Son loves the Father. The Father delights in the Son, and the Son delights in the Father. And the Holy Spirit is the embodiment of all of that love and delight. And the Father and the Son have publicly declared that they will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. Jesus calls the Spirit the promise of the Father, and the Father will not be shamed. He will keep his promise. Oh, how grateful I lived in Asia. And then traveled in the Middle East to learn what I don't think I would have otherwise learned. So, can you imagine Mr. Outside receiving a guest at midnight, needing to feed him, and going to Mr. Inside and asking for help to feed his guest and being told to go away. Can you imagine that? No. It's impossible. Mr. Inside will get up and he will give Mr. Outside as much as he needs. So, Can you imagine you or I going to God the Father in the name of God the Son and asking for more of God the Holy Spirit and being told to go away? No. The Father will get up and he will give you as much of the Holy Spirit as you need. Let us pray. What of God do you need today? What of God do you need in order to extend 
God's hospitality to others. What of God do you need? Ask. In the asking, you will receive. Something always happens. God gives more of himself. Lord Jesus, thank you for revealing what none of us would have ever deduced on our own. Thank you for revealing the shameless heart of the Father. And will you help us now live the rest of our lives in light of this great truth. Amen.